Buenos and half a day. Thank you everyone for being here. The Committee on Education, Self-Determination, Historic Preservation, Infrastructure, Border Safety, Federal and Foreign Affairs, and Maritime Transportation will now convene for this roundtable hearing. Today is Monday, April 18th, 2022, and it is currently, we'll say 12.08 in the afternoon. For the record and in accordance with open government law, public notices were sent out via email to all senators, stakeholders, and the Guam Daily Post on Monday, April 11, 2022. And the second notice on Thursday, April 14, 2022. Notice of today's hearing was also available on the Guam Legislature's website. Joining us today uh, is my colleague, Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you, Senator, for being present today. The roundtable hearing is, is to provide an update for the, to the community and the listening audience in addressing the following items. The general discussion on the current status of Bill Number 114-36-COR as it pertains to the Customs and Quarantine Agency, the Port Authority of Guam, and the Guam Airport Authority. Bill Number 114-36-COR was introduced April 12, 2021 with the intent of amending subsections 73102, 73107, 73109, 73141, and 73142 of Chapter 73, Title V, Guam Code Annotated, relative to the powers of customs officers, definitions, guard on vessels, place of inspection, and release of sealed cargo at Guam's ports of entry, and to further updating the penalties in violation of these statutory requirements. The proposed legislation came about due to the Guam Customs and Quarantines Agency needing to further define the authority of the director of the CQA and the powers of the Guam Customs officers to ensure they fulfill their mandates and missions of safeguarding our island's borders and its ports of entry. Since its introduction one year ago, it has been made apparent that the bill is still currently under legal review by the Office of the Attorney General Additionally, on September of last year, I was notified of a meeting with the governor's legal advisors, the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency, the Port Authority of Guam, and the Guam International Airport Authority, where a review of the bill identified certain concerns and technical issues that should be addressed, and that the parties aforementioned have agreed to collaborate and create a formal agreement which could serve as the basis for this bill to be framed on. This roundtable hearing will provide discussions on the bill and will serve as its update to its current status of the legal review as it pertains to safeguarding our island's borders, ports of entry, and to provide clarity for all parties involved as we move forward to seeing the intent of this legislation come to fruition. Okay. With me today, we have the directors of Customs and Quarantine Agency, um, Mr. Ike Pareto. We have our chief of Customs and Quarantine Agency, Chief Perez. We have our general manager, executive manager of the Guam International Airport Authority, and the chief of airport police. We did receive um, an email notification saying that they, uh, the Port Authority of Guam representatives were not able to make it today. And um, so I will leave it at that, and I will offer the floor to the Director of Customs and Quarantine Agency to speak on the bill. Good afternoon, Senator, and members of this run here in committee, Senator Brown. My name is Ike Pareto, and I'm the Director of the Customs and Quarantine Agency. I would like to introduce my uh, Chief of Customs, then Paris is to my right. I would like to start out by saying that since 1950, Guam Customs relied heavily on the inspection authorities of border enforcement partners and exercised enforcement authority in the shadow of federal border enforcement agencies such as USDA, Department of Agriculture, US Fish and Wildlife, and US Customs Border Protection. The Customs and Quarantine Agency continues to increase capacity by modernizing laws and technologies to with Guam's economic drivers. Bill 114, 
Class 36 will enable customs to be self-reliant agency with definitive legislations for increased enforcement capacity. Public Law 35-105 updated Guam Customs Manifest requirements and improved Guam Customs clearance and competencies to remain functionally aligned with Guam's rapidly modernizing maritime and aviation transportation industry. Bill 114 sets in place clear and specific authorities and parameters within the expeditious movement of merchandise and people. The enhancement of definitions, clarity of where the border exists, expansion and explanation of enforcement areas, penalties and fines for violations at the border ensures business at the border is conducted in a safe and secure manner, complete with suitable controls for streamlined movement of passengers, commodity, and merchandise. This bill is necessary as it gives customs agency a stronger formalized customs authority, which is in line with the federal counterparts. Let me give you an example. The United States Customs Border Patrol security authority is derived from federal statutes and regulations including 19 CFR 162.6, which states that all persons, baggage, and merchandise arriving in the customs territory of the United States from a place outside thereof are liable for inspection by CBP officers. Unless exempted diplomatic status, all persons entering the United States, including U.S. citizens, are subject to the examination and search by CBP officers. This bill allows CQA to further develop regulations which exist in providing a solid framework of custom-centric authorities and requirements. Additionally, if this were a port of entry in the United States territory, there would be much more control relating to access of sterile areas in which customs functions are carried out. CBP requires any person who has unescorted access to the custom security area must openly display or produce upon demand an approved access seal issued by customs. Access is granted through a vetted application process with customs. Employers are required, required all employees on these regulations. Congress has sent feet to enact sweeping legislation towards border security in the protection of the United States. It has provided funding and sources to the federal entities. For some reason, Guam Customs has not received this same assistance because Guam falls under or outside the U.S. Customs territory of the United States. The role of customs enforcement is carried out through Guam Customs and quarantine and not the federal government. This bill addresses some challenges relating to customs enforcement, the integrity of the border, and the people of Guam. Guam Customs understands the need for strong relationships between our airport and our seaport operators and believe strongly that by ensuring border security controls remain, remain consummated with the passenger and sea cargo through port, through port airport and seaport operators seek to achieve, then Guam Custom remains a relevant team player as a facilitator of trade and steward to border security. We have reviewed the bill uh, Madam Chairman, and we have some recommendations that we would like to submit to the committee as we proceed with this particular uh, initiative. And at this time, I do believe we have made copies of it, of our, uh, our uh, amendments to the regulations, and hopefully that we will receive uh, an update legal review from the AG on this matter. And this is where we're at at this point in time. Can we just uh, get a copy of the testimony so we can hand it out to everyone and okay. then we can uh, go ahead and discuss the recommendations, uh, Director, that you have uh, for Bill, for this Bill 114-36. Um, Thank you.
to be given. Yes. yes. So we think that what are some of the sections that we are doing? So just to be clear, we had this roundtable hearing because we were getting a lot of um, back and forth um, amongst the agencies about some of their concerns, right? So before we move forward with the public hearing, we want to hear from all the parties and their perspective. And uh, should this improve the bill, some of the recommendations that are put forth, then we will apply that, um, at, we will mention that at the public hearing and, you know, on session floor, we will substitute it in the committee markup. So uh, just to recap, so now we are having this roundtable hearing so that Customs and Quarantine can bring their recommendations on how to strengthen the bill. Um, and perhaps some of the discussions that has been going on with the Port Authority and the Airport Authority, they can also have their say at the table as well. Okay, so go ahead, uh, Director, and proceed with the recommendations that you feel should be added to Bill Number 114-36, and perhaps if you can also give an explanation of uh, what the recommendation will do uh, towards the function and assisting CQA and their officers in performing their job duties within, the, within this measure. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, well, first of all, I would like to uh to mention that we did uh, look at the intent of the bill. We changed uh, some of the language on the intent of the bill. Uh, we stopped in it. Uh, we identified that uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, we work closely with both the, uh, the operators at the airport, the EM, the executive manager, the port authority, to include the port authority, that we have been working closely with them in this matter. And so there's, there's some, uh, Rubrics that we just changed there to, to, to show that we have been collaborating with Airport Authority and the uh, Port Authority during this particular matter, and we wanted to just change and soften that. That will cover the intent of the bill. Chief? So as we, as we, as we move on, uh, go ahead. Hafari, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So we, we actually collaborated when we had our last meeting with both the Port Authority and the Airport Authority. There were some suggestions on improving the, the, the language of the bill and uh, we softened uh, part of the preamble uh, that basically um, really highlights the fact that Guam Customs in collaboration with both the Port Authority and the Airport Authority are working together towards uh, ensuring the protection of our border. And then some of the other changes um, deal, deal with... Um, what exactly did you soften, Chief? What, what was the reason for utilizing the word soften? Was the, was the bill to... What was, what was the challenge that you saw in the bill? Did it not afford the Customs and Quarantine Agency to, to move forward with their duty descriptions? It, no, it, it actually was more like, um, in, in reading it, it almost seemed like we were negatively attacking the capabilities of the collaboration between the Port Authority and Customs and the Airport Authority. And what we found was that, you know, we're not we're not trying to fight each other. We're just trying to make sure that we're working together in collaboration. And so um, we took that back. Uh, I don't have a copy of the old um, statute, okay. but it was something that is referenced. <sighs> okay, so what in the legislative intent was negative? That was not fact. Uh, since I don't have the, the legislation, I, if I can recall, it was like um, Guam Customs was unable 
to be able to do certain things. And then we flipped it around and just said in collaboration with, uh, with both the airport authority and the port authority, we collaborate and then we gave uh, an example of uh, our partnership like with the ZBV X-ray backscatter uh, and the port CCTV camera system which is used in augmentation of port security. Okay, so let's just read the legislative intent for the record on the original bill as introduced. It is section one, legislative intent and findings. Ilis Latoran Guahan finds that the subsections of 5GCA, chapter 17, 73, dealing with the powers of custom officers, definition, guard on vessels, place of inspection, and release of sealed cargo at Guam's ports of entry directly affect the effective flow of people and merchandise entering or departing Guam. These statutes also provide the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency lawful tools to secure the safety of Guam's community. These subsections require amendments to meet the increased demands of Guam's import and export industry and ensure deliberate application of security. Elis Latour and Guahan finds that the director of the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency and CQA customs officers have been challenged on their power and authority at Guam's ports of entry, at enforcement areas, at Guam's borders, at places that exist as functional equivalents of the border, and places of unlawful arrival and entry. Through this legislation, Elis Latour and Guahan further defines the authority of the director of CQA and the powers of customs officers to ensure the safe and effective fulfillment of CQA's mandates and mission. Elisa Torangwahan finds that historical naval government statutes such as guard on vessels requires specificity to ensure useful statutory existence. Elisa Torangwahan expands CQ, CQA's guard on vessels requirement for conveyances, vessels, aircraft, and contrivances arriving in Guam. Elisator and Guahan finds that the airport and seaport operators did not honor the authority of the director of CQA asserted in designated places of inspection and the executive responsibility of the director to establish controls for persons, conveyances, vehicles, aircraft, vessels, and other contrivances present at Guam's ports of entry, at custom areas of enforcement, at customs jurisdictions, at Guam's borders, at places that exist as functional equivalents of the border, and places of unlawful arrival and entry, and places of inspection designated by the director. Perhaps maybe this is one of the areas. Okay. Okay. Okay, sure. Um, Elisa Torn Guahan finds that goods and prohibited contraband are making their way into Guam via United States mail. These items are evading inspection by the Customs and Quarantine Agency because custom officers have limited authority to inspect mail when it arrives at the airport or seaports. When a package or letter is delivered to the U U.S. Postal Service, it remains under the custody of the United States Postal Service until it is delivered to the rightful addressee. As such, for customs purposes, a package or lettering entering Guam through the United States Postal Service does not officially enter Guam until it is out of the United States Postal Service custody. To address this issue, Elis Latour and Guahan designates the United States Postal Post Office as an official port of entry. Elis Latour and Guahan also finds that money laundering and the illicit manufacture, distribution, possession of controlled substances involving the use of the U.S. mail and the U.S. Postal Service are particularly destructive to the island of Guam. The unimpeded introduction of illicit controlled substances and the inability of the Customs and Quarantine Agency to collect revenue are two of the greatest threats to Guam's economy, health, and lifestyle of its people. Elis Latour and Guahan finds not all containers and cargo entering Guam are affixed with a seal from the port of origin. That's an issue. This condition creates opportunities for compromised security, increased contraband, smuggling, and unwanted tampering, which causes detriments to the community. 
Ilisator and Guahan, through this legislation, mandates all containers and cargo entering Guam be affixed with seals at the point of origin. As the first line of defense for the island of Guam, the CQA is tasked with protecting borders, securing ports of entry, and facilitating trade, commerce, and travel. This legislation provides CQA with the legal implements to protect our island, our people, and our resources. And so now we have um, a recommendation for the legislative intent, and it reads a little bit differently, so I'm going to read the recommendation for the record. Ilicitor and Guahan finds amendments are needed for subsections of Title V, Guam Code Annotated, Chapter 73, which enable the powers of customs officers, definition guard on vessels, place of inspection, and release of sealed cargo at Guam's ports of entry. These subsections directly impact the effective flow of people and merchandise entering or departing Guam. These sections of statute also provide the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency lawful tools and much needed controls to secure the safety of Guam's community, especially in an environment where the delicate balance of, throughout, of throughput, speed, and border enforcement must be achieved. These subsections require amendments to align with the increased demand of Guam's ports, Guam's import and export industry, and to ensure deliberate application of security. Ilicitor and Guam finds the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency dutifully positioned to undertake the impeding, impending expansion and diversif diversification of Guam's economic drivers. Transshipment and pre-clearance proposals continue to gain favor as Guam explores pathways to recover from the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Guam Customs must continue its modernization to sustain the agency's intent to remain a reliable player on a team focused on Guam's growth, Guam's growth and evolution. So this is a change. Okay, Ilicitor and Guahan finds that interagency relationship between government agencies operating at Guam's border contribute directly to buttressing air and sea commerce security platforms for safe and seamless throughput of people and merchandise. This is also a change. At the airport and the seaport, the Guam International Airport Authority and the Port Authority of Guam's forthright relationship with the Guam Customs is evidenced by the airport and seaport operators. Insistence for, Guam's cust for Guam Customs unimpe unimpeded access to all areas of these border ports of entry. The Port Authority as a border partner supported Guam Customs financially by incorporating Guam Customs in the 2020 Master Plan and by assisting in the repair of the ZBV X-ray backscatter van. Operationally, the Port Authority authorized Guam Customs access to the port CCTV camera system, included Guam Customs inspection feasibility study in the 2020 master plan, dedicated office space for customs clearance processes, dedicated real estate and office space at seaplane ramp, and a secured warehouse for container inspections. This is also a change. So ideally, we're not challenging the assistance that the autonomous agencies has given CQA. What we're trying to do here is address the authority that the, the officers need, the CQA officers need, in order to protect our borders and our island, OK? Similarly, the airport authority collaborated extensively with Guam Customs to incorporate Customs border security concerns into the airport authority's security plan, provided access to the airport authority's CCTV camera system, ensured Guam Customs participates in airport first responder exercises, and invited Guam to participate in interagency airport border security operations. Ilesator and Guahan finds that the Customs and Quarantine Agency continues to mature and increase capacity by modernizing laws and technology commensurate with the Guam's economic drivers. Since the 1950s, Guam Customs relied heavily on the inspection authorities of border enforcement, partners such as the U.S. Department of Agriculture, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and U.S. Customs and Border and Protection. So this is also a change. With the passage of Bill 114-36, Guam Customs is enabled to evolve from being an agency that exercised enforcement authority 
in the shadow of federal border enforcement counterparts to an agency taking greater ownership of border controls. Ilis Latour and Guahan finds Public Law 35-105 updated Guam Customs Manifest requirements and places Guam Customs functions alongside a rapidly modernizing transportation industry. The streamlined and automated manifest process creates a faster speed for imported merchandise. Bill 114-36 sets in place clear and specific authorities and parameters where the enhancement of definition, clarity of where the border exists, expansion and explanation of enforcement areas and penalties and fines for violation at the border ensures business at the border is conducted expeditiously and with suitable controls for harmonious movement of commodities and merchandise. Through this legislation, Elisator and Guahan further defines the authority of the director of CQA and the powers of the customs officers to ensure the safe and effective fulfillment of CQA's mandates and missions. Elisator and Guahan finds that historical neighbor government statutes such as guard on vessels require specificity to ensure useful statutory existence. Elisator and Guahan expand CQA's guard on vessels requirement for conveyances vessels, aircrafts, and contrivances arriving in Guam. Okay, that seems pretty the same. Elisa Tora in Guahan finds not all containers and cargo entering Guam are fixed with a seal from the point of origin. This condition creates opportunities for compromised security, increased contraband smuggling, and unwanted tampering, which cause detriments to the community. Elisa Tora in Guahan, through this legislation, mandates all containers and cargo entering Guam be affixed with seals at the point of origin. As the first line of defense for the island of Guam, the CQA is tasked with protecting borders, securing ports of entry, and facilitating, tra facilitating trade, commerce, and travel. This legislation provides CQA with the legal implements to protect our island, our people, and our resources. So a lot of the changes that were basically made um, as a summary is, is just to show that the interagency collaboration with the port and the airport authority. Okay, very good. And I'd like to thank you. Um, both agencies, unfortunately the port is not here, but for the collaboration that they have. I know you have a lot of things to say, but we want to finish with the other recommendations that CQA has, and then we'll afford you, um, Mr. Mr. JQ, <laughs> the opportunity yes, to speak. Okay, thank you. Okay, Chief, please continue, or Director, thank you. I believe our first change is on, uh, found on page um, eight uh, under section three, uh, section 73107 of chapter 73, the bold section under line item seven on the, on the left. Um, where it says Title V Guam annotated is hereby amended to read Section 73107 Guard on Vessels. We also added in a slash aircraft because vessels, uh, normally when people are associated, they, they think about boats. So we're, we're in putting the, the inclusiveness of the aircraft in there. And then um, we also, uh, down on line 27, we we included uh, okay. okay so we included um, actually it's on page nine nine I, I think I got it. Yeah. so page nine um, it says at the top of the page it says of the crew of any such vessel we ch we added or aircraft uh, or any individual who infringes customs legal authority on the vessel or aircrafts. And then uh, on the next page, on page 10, uh, four lines down, we inserted the word after customs officers, we inserted inspectors. And moving on to page 12, under line item 14, we added uh, subject to the approval of the Magat Hagat Guam, right after where it says uh, may be assigned to it by the director or otherwise by applicable laws. 
So right immediately, right after that, it says subject to the approval of the Maga Haga Guam. No. Uh, on page 18, under line two, we added the word laws applicable to Guam. So it, it reads, uh, same shall have taken, detained, or seized by any officer or other person under the authority of, and that's where we inserted, laws applicable to Guam, or by any person authorized to make searches and seizures shall be fined $10,000. And I think, is this a, and I believe that's the uh, summary of the of the changes, aside from the preamble. Okay, very good. Director, is there anything else you'd like to add, or do you, would you like me to? Yes, uh, okay. Can I just say something? If you notice, Go ahead and uh, turn your turn turn your mic on. If you notice on the preamble that we didn't say anything about the post office, and the reason for that is that we were waiting for legal, the AG to come back to us to, to give us guidance on that, and that's why we didn't show that. Thank I you. understand. Okay, thank you, Director. Okay, um, Mr. JQ, the Executive Manager of the Airport. Good morning, Senators. Um, thank you for having me. I'm John Kanatz. I'm the Executive Manager here at the Airport. Basically, we came here with the uh, old, uh, or the previous bill that uh, was introduced and the current one. And, uh, and I had highlighted the questions that I had, but uh, they, uh, customs seems to, to um, change the exact uh, language on the intent, which now makes us comfortable uh, in supporting this bill. So a lot of the things that they have put in uh, definitely is good uh, that they've, uh, they've made the change. Uh, I was going to comment about the post office because uh, definitely that is a that is an issue uh, with mail coming in, but uh, of course we're waiting for legal to come back with that uh, that response. Uh, definitely for Marianne, uh, all the things I was going to say they've already answered. They've they've uh, they put it in on this uh, the the recommendations that they're going to put in. Uh, so that concerns uh, those concerns that I have have definitely been, been uh, um, addressed. I will say from the airport's perspective that uh, we understand and we work collaboratively and we, we work together with Guam Customs in any of their enforcement uh, efforts. Uh, so from the airport site, um, we, hopefully, and I, I have not heard from Guam Customs, but our chief of police uh, and Guam Customs, in as far as the uh, keeping the airport safe, that is our priority. That is definitely what we're there for. And so we, we definitely work with them closely. Chief, anything? Okay. Yeah, Chief of the Airport, please. Yeah, I have no comment. I share the same sentiments. So. Can you just m mention your name for the record, please, and oh, yeah. speak so into the mic? Vicente Napti, Chief of Airport Police. And so I, I share the same sentiments as the Executive Manager. Um, I don't think in any way we have impeded uh, customs uh, in their investigatory uh, um, uh, cases, and we continue to work alongside with them with no issues. Thank you, Chief. Okay, I'll now open the um, hearing up for questions from our, my colleagues. Okay, so Senator Brown, do you have any questions for the agencies? I see it's quite an extensive change in the law or additions to existing law with, I assume, what you feel you need for your enforcement powers. Why is that? What are your current laws that are prohibiting you from addressing the enforcement authority of customs that we assume you've always had? I mean, this is pretty much underlined page after page, so it's a significant change in language. Thank you, Senator. So when you take a look at the uh, custom statutes as um, uh, from the inception of when we were first enacted into legislation uh, back in the 50s, we slowly evolved and it was only recently where customs is starting to take a um, piecemeal approach towards legislation. So 
Uh, in the previous uh, uh, go around, we've managed to create legislation addressing manifests and electronic submissions. If you take a look at the, the GCA as it existed prior to that, you'll see that a lot of the, uh, the statute is, is old. Um, let me paint you a picture. The United States Customs and Border Protection under the umbrella of Homeland Security evolved rapidly since September 11th. Guam Customs and the government of Guam have not um, evolved as quickly. So we realize that we need to make these changes. You're looking at statute that's been around um, way before my time, and some of the provisions that have been changed over the years uh, didn't really address any of the, the mandates as it relates to border security or additional um, regulations since the inception of the Homeland Security umbrella and regulations covering uh, terrorist attack, uh, attacks of September 11th. So what this does is that as part of a piecemeal, we're changing uh, where we can bite off. We, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew. So in this iteration, we're going to be addressing these changes with uh, this legislation. Thank you. And beyond the additional jurisdiction that you're expanding to, I mean, have you looked, is there additional costs that the rate payers are gonna be expected to pay? Because I see also, of course, your jurisdiction is within the, um, what, 12, 12 nautical miles that you have outlined, how you are going to address that enforcement. I mean, currently, normally, if it's a vessel coming in, uh, the port accommodates to be able to take your officers out and board the vessel. Could be a cruise ship, could be a cargo ship coming in. Um, are you guys looking at, at building that capacity in your operations? Are you already started in doing that so that you're able to go board vessels if you need to to do these type of inspections within what you are looking at uh, as far as your, your, your jurisdiction off the coastlines of Guam? Yes, Senator, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we, have, we do have a joint agreement with NOAA right now. Um, and mostly uh, they're funding uh, a certain portion of our uh, resources, especially manpower, in providing us equipment, vessels, to, uh, to monitor our, uh, our uh, shorelines. And hopefully that we can continue, continue to, to uh, try and, and enforce the, uh, the federal laws that are also required here in Guam. So that's one of the capacity that we're, we're looking at. In, but you guys don't receive any, any federal funding, do you, for, for enforcement? Because unlike other mainland jurisdictions, obviously, the federal government picks up that tab for border protection. We don't have that here on no. Guam. No. But do they provide you any other type of support, grants, or anything to assist in facilitating border protection? Because, of course, we know it's not just for Guam, but also the benefit of the United States government. So with... with Yes. So with the NOAA program, it actually gives us funding. Um, we provide funding up front, and they give us uh, money as soon as we spend it. So there is, there is a tie-in with some funding, and we also have uh, several uh, vessels uh, assigned to the Guam Customs and Quarantine Agency's uh, uh, marine unit. So we have assets currently available, but if you're asking if we're looking at increasing the resources, the answer is yes, and we will also be looking at um, utilizing uh, current grant funding like with the Port Security Grant to be able to maybe perhaps in the future uh, purchase uh, additional vessels. But with the additional vessels right now, we also need additional manpower and everybody's strapped for personnel. So um, we'll get there. It's just that um, everything is kind of like piecemeal. We slowly get there. We want to make sure that we're not trying to operate outside of our capacity to be able to perform our duties. So, uh, yes, there, there will be uh, maybe some funding that um, we may need to look at, but uh, because we're trying to be diligent in making sure that we protect the finances, not just of the agency, but of the government of Guam, we're looking at other opportunities like grants and asset sharing and uh, programs to that effect. Well, one of the things also that's looked in here is regards to your ability to confiscate. It could be illegal contraband, whatever the case may be, that customs takes possession of because it's not allowed into Guam. 
Um, have you guys outlined your policy with regards to what the, what the chain of, of custody will be for these items and ultimately what is the ultimate disposal? Because we've had complaints in the past that things have been confiscated and yet when the items are requested to either be returned or whatever the case may be, it has not been found and it, it was taken in the possession of customs. And also just to avoid it being an issue. I mean, if it's something that's not supposed to come into Guam, then obviously we're gonna to wanna to make sure it's properly disposed of and we wanna have evidence that it's properly disposed of. It might be the, you know, the fake Gucci purse, but it could be you know, a $1,000 uh, speed bike for all I know. Um, how, how do, what is your chain of custody? Because I think that's important if, if you're certainly having all these authorities to confiscate under the laws of Guam. Um, what is the outline chain of custody and for what period of time? I mean, maybe if it's part of an investigation, I understand you might have to hold on to things for certain, maybe longer because it's part of an investigation until that's completed. Uh, but if it's not something that involves a, you know, a roundabout, maybe they didn't, they didn't declare it, it could be an item they could have brought in and they didn't declare it and you know, maybe they have to pay a fee or whatever and they're able to come back and correct that. Maybe you guys issue them a penalty because they didn't properly report it, but it's not something illegal, but just not properly claimed. Um, what is your chain of custody that can be followed to verify and then where do we know that these items go, that they're either properly returned if it's nothing illegal or if it's properly disposed? Where's the evidence to show so that it doesn't end up in somebody else's hands? Because it has in the past. I mean, some of the most recent, you know, uh, convictions have been of customs officers. So, you know, I mean, we want to make sure everybody's on the up and up and everybody stays on the up and up. But sometimes law enforcement themselves, you know, whatever the temptation. Uh, so, so what is the plan that everyone can look at and even, you know, our customers that come in, they, they know what the process is so that they can verify that things are being properly handled once customs takes possession of it. Okay. Thank you, Senator, for that question. So Guam Customs, we, we collaborate for different entities and many times they're, we, in moving forward with intercepting an item, there is always a document that is attached that either shows uh, what, it, what the item is uh, and where it's going. And normally that's associated with uh, like a chain of custody, like you, you, you say. Um, some items, when we intercept them, we refer them to the entity that we collaborate for. Like for the Department of Agriculture, we, we intercept fruits and vegetables that are prohibited or restricted from coming in. We don't hold them. It goes to the Department of Agriculture for their review and disposition. We hold items like narcotics uh, up to a certain point and there's a chain of custody attached to that and it stays in our evidence room until such time that it is used for evidentiary purposes or for testing. So if you're asking what is the process, some items uh, are not left to the agency to adjudicate. In many cases, the items that are seized and intercepted are taken and referred, and then the entity that we collaborate for are the ones that would do their diligence as far as administrative hearings in moving forward. If there's anything that we normally would be able to do uh, if in regards to like things coming in and trying to rectify it. We work with the importer if, if it's possible. But certain things aren't possible, like vehicles that come in and they're non-conforming. Normally what we do is we, we let the importer know that they have to get into conformance or we destroy it. And the option they have is they ship it back or bring it to conformance. And many times they're unable to do so. If it's narcotics, you're not getting it back. If it's medication, it goes through a hearing with public health. So depending on the entity that we collaborate for, um, there are administrative uh, provisions that allow for it, but in some cases, there aren't. Well, I'm just saying in the, some cases, they might not be illegal items that are being brought in, but let's say they're importing, but they don't list it on their manifest. They're not charged the taxes for it. Uh, and they might have to go back. You might assume, I assume, take custody of it and then hopefully they're able, if they're able to, properly address, you know, remediate it by, you know, paying the, the fees or the fines or whatever may, may be. But, but then it's wanting to ensure that these items are returned properly if they're 
to be returned and they're not illegal narcotics or weapons or things that uh, would not be allowed in. I think just because it has been an issue in the past with customs, I mean, back in the day, it's the same thing. That's why they tag, you know, the containers because sometimes the, uh, you know, employees at the port that were unloading the containers were opening the containers back in the day and, you know, taking out things they liked and uh, there was nowhere verifying the safety and security of the items being brought in. So the same thing with customs is, is having a clear protocol, as you mentioned, if it's, if it's agriculture to go to agriculture, but not all these items are going to go out to another agency. Some of them are going to be held in customs possession until there's resolution. Uh, and if it's not something illegal and it's being held because perhaps they didn't list it on their manifest that they're importing it, uh, and then you hold it for a period of time, and then you know they, they address correction to it. It gets you know the the hope is that it gets properly returned. But it's that interim period. Is is how is it? How is the security of those items maintained? Because it, you know people are human. Unfortunately, they get. I mean, we've seen it even in those that were hired to unload cargo from air cargo. You know, oh, wow, I, I like that computer. I like that Xbox. I like the, and they were walking off with it. This is something that's just happened in the last couple of years. And these are people that are hired to unload. Uh, and, and be able to distribute and unfortunately they, they you know they were like doing their own shopping while they're going along the process and it, it's just also to protect the individual from maybe thinking twice if they know that hey there I have to account for this there has to be versus oh we don't know what happened to it and that's the end of the story if it's properly followed there has to be a chain of command how these items are handed over who has custody of them where they're being stored um, and, and that they're accountable, that Customs is accountable for it, so that we're not concerned that those that are supposed to be protecting our, our safety and security are, you know, involved in anything illegal or improper or abusing their authority because of the authority that you have. I think the public wants to have some comfort with that. So I, I just think that's also something that perhaps you guys can outline and, and is readily available for the public, what those procedures are. I, I'm assuming you have something in writing. Maybe that's something that also can be added to strengthen these additional uh, expansion of authority that's been given to the agency. So everybody knows what it is. People that are importing, they know, hey, I forgot to do it. My, oh, this is the process. Okay, so I know what I need to do or whatever the case may be. That it's not just so-and-so said. It's something in writing that we know. And then also that we have a clear outline of accountability on customs part that uh, these items are going to be available at the time they're supposed to be returned. They don't, so they don't disappear. Let me, let me just respond to that, Senator. Uh Everything that's being seized in customs must follow the, 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 the policy as it relates to interception. We do have a property of this custodian office that is responsible for uh, accounting each and every items that are seized. And the officer that seized these items must prepare the documentation that goes with the merchandise. The individual that's handling that PECO office is responsible to store it in a secure area that's identified by the agency. And that's what the chief is trying to elude. So yes, we do have that. No, I, I understand all that. But I've also, from experience, known that even though that's been in place, that's not always been the case because the items have not been able to be produced. Yeah. So I'm just saying there's got to be, you need to look at how you strengthen that so we know where it ended. Who had it? And if it disappeared, how did it disappear? Who had it in their possession at the time it disappeared? So there's some accountability. So we don't you know, have people, because of their weakness, choosing to right. abuse their position or capacity to take things that, you know, they shouldn't be taking, right? Okay. So, yes, we can, we can take a look at that. And if there's uh, anything that we may need to update or improve, we will, we will, of course, we're willing to do so. You only, in hindsight, you get better at something if you find something happened and it, and it didn't go the way you planned. Now, the beauty of this uh, bill right now is that it, what, you're, what you're saying is that this bill will also help us to help strengthen uh, in areas like what you mentioned regarding uh, chain of uh, custody and, and property. So if we're able to initiate penalties, fines, and uh, shore up our legislation because it's outdated, it would go a long way to helping us develop much more improved rules and regulations as it relates to uh, interception of items, uh, access to customs areas, uh, requirements uh, that were probably uh, lacking in, in, uh, from years ago because of the, the massive changes that happened since September 11th. So yes, we, will, we can take a look at um, our processes and look to see where we can improve upon them. Well, I look forward to it. Trust me, I'll ask. So I, I hope you can look at strengthening that. Thank you, Senator Brown. Yes, uh, 
you know, just to reiterate what you said, Chief, I think some of the challenges with the chain of custody is all the other types of agencies, be it federal or local agencies, were challenging the jurisdictions of the CQA and, and whose agency's right to, to take over the, the control. And so by establishing CQA's roles and authority, it would be a lot clearer on the process of the chain of custody, most especially. Okay, I do have a question. The, um, the change from reasonable suspicion to probable cause, uh, which is found under the, uh, the power of customs officers, can you just talk a little bit about that? Um, okay, so the change uh, came about uh, when we had our initial meeting uh, over at the governor's office in which the legal counsel um, was uh, mentioning that uh, the change needed to happen. So we just um, decided that it, to be able to at least strengthen it, we will follow uh, at least that part of the recommendation inclusive of all the other recommendations that were made uh, during that time between uh, the Port Authority and the Airport Authority and Guam Customs. Thank you, and then can you also just list for us the unfunded mandates that CQA has to follow? And where, where do I begin? Um, so there, I'll use like agriculture as an example. Whenever we intercept uh, prohibited fruits and vegetables that come in, and we take an item from the passenger, there's nowhere for us to be able to destroy it because anything that take, has an enforcement action like destroying, we have, no, we have to pull that out of our own funding. And just like any other entity that we, we enforce. So this goes back to our 5GCA chapter three and our collaboration with different entities when the laws that were established developed the rules in which customs does its inspections and enforcement actions, many of the, uh, the regulations did not put any provision for, for funding to destroy or to, to do any enforcement action. Um, we are left with trying to just take it out of hide and most especially because of the pandemic, we're, we're having to reach backwards and look for uh, funding not just from the legislature, but also from um, grants and, and anything else where we can, we're able to get some funding. We rely a lot on destroying by burning and uh, we run out of funding rather quickly. Um, we have officers assigned to perform inspections uh, for the military in which um, that is paid for uh, directly from the Customs and Quarantine Agency's operating budget, and there aren't any, um, there's, there's no funding uh, thrown in from anywhere else. I'm not sure if you have any other. I think, Senator, from the, uh, from the airport site, if there's anything that is passenger related, they definitely can put it in, in part, as part of their uh, funding source so that it can be covered, but definitely that can uh, be funded by the air passenger uh, service charge. So, but I think he's referring to other than air passenger site. Yes. Are there any unfunded mandates when it, in regards to items coming in through the International Airport Authority? Uh, yes, I, I mentioned one earlier. It's like if um, passengers bring in uh, fruits or vegetables that are, or meat products or, or items that are contrary to the law that uh, allows its entry. Other than that one? Uh, Down at the port, yeah. Like what? Yeah, but airport, she's asking. Airport. airport. And then what about the port? How about this? When we have the public hearing on the bill, can you also bring a list of your unfunded mandates? Thank you, because I know that you have quite a few. And so that would be also good for my colleagues to also understand some of the challenges that CQA faces as well. All right, thank you. Okay, are there any other testimonies or any other remarks that you would like to say before we close this uh, round table hearing? I just wanted to, uh, on their uh, recommendation, it was on page 12, I think. 
just so that you, ha you don't have to go back and amend the bill. Um, if that can be changed to Governor of Guam instead of Magahaga, because as, as we change, uh, you don't want to be amending that just because of that, but it, that's, that'll be the recommendation. Thank yes. you. Yes. All right, very good, thank you. Yes, because this, this, uh, if this bill passes, uh, as this will go down into the books in our GCA, and so we want to make sure we're consistent, also looking forward to uh, future impacts of CQA and also the future leadership of our island. Okay, very good. All right. So now that we have exhausted all the items on the agenda, I thank you for coming and giving in your testimonies and ways for us to strengthen this measure. Uh, we look to have a public hearing very soon on this bill and um, also do a committee markup to take the recommendations and bring it on session floor so that CQA officers are able to act well within their authority um, with confidence knowing that the law is behind them. Okay. So if there are no further questions or testi testimonies, we will conclude this roundtable hearing. The committee will continue to accept written testimony for the next 10 working days as Senator T.C. Nelson at guamlegislature.org or delivered to the office of Senator Talina Cruz Nelson at Suite 202 Alpha 173 Espino Avenue, Haganya, Guam, 96910. A recording of today's hearing will be available on the YouTube at Guam Legislature Media. This concludes our roundtable hearing. It is now 1.05 in the afternoon. Thank you very much for coming and happy Easter. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.